good morning all and welcome to the show again. Today we've got a special guest, Miss Natalie Hay. How are you doing, Natalie? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Sean. Uh, happy to be here. Great. She plays for Aston Villa and she's a centre-half. And it's a real pleasure to have you on today. How's COVID been treating you? <laughs> yeah, probably better than some, I guess. Like we're quite lucky that obviously we're still allowed to train and play at the moment. So for us, it's it's ideal to be able to go out of the house, get to work, um, and obviously enjoy playing playing the sport that we love. But I really feel for those people that have maybe been stuck at home all this time. I, when it first started, I actually still had a full-time job and I was working from home and it was really tricky. So I got a lot of sympathy for those who've been stuck at home over the past, you know, 10 to 12 months. Yeah, it's been real tough, but we hope everyone stays safe at this moment and good to hear that you're okay as well. I'll pass you on to my co-host, Carl. Hi, Natalie. Hope you're well. So the, what we're going to start off with is a question where you often hear in football, somebody will say, she's got it or he's got it. So what we're referring to is what do you think was your it factor that's elevated you to the level that you play at? Yeah, I think for me, it's probably just my um, kind of willingness to keep going. Um, I stopped playing a few times because I thought, you know, I'm done. Like I want to focus on my career, coaching, uh, full time work away from the pitch. So, yeah, I think for me, it's just that desire to to want to still play at, at the highest level that I can, given my age. Um, and yeah, just just maybe the ability to to keep going and keep pushing my body to its limits and, and trying to stay fit. Um, I think that's been a consistent throughout my career. Um, I've never been the most technically gifted player. Um, but I've always had a willingness to work hard and, you know, I'm, I'd, I'd like to think I'm, I'm a good leader as well, a good communicator. So, yeah, I think just that, just that drive and that desire to, to keep going and, and make sure I look after myself and put myself in a position um, to play at, at the highest level that I can, really. Brilliant. And while we're speaking about that desire to, to succeed, a lot of people may not know this, but unless you're playing in possibly the top two divisions in women's football, you won't be a full-time footballer. You will have to have a full-time job elsewhere and other jobs and responsibilities. How do you feel that helped you cope with them responsibilities? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, even the championship, most of those girls aren't, aren't full-time and that's where we were last year. So I was working, you know, nine, ten-hour days uh, running a women's football academy and then driving an hour um, to get to training um, and, you know, go to sleep, get up, repeat uh, five, six days a week. So yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, but, but like I said, I think it's that, it's that desire and that motivation to, to want to be the best that I can be in, in everything that I do. So whether that's my full-time job or whether that's playing football, it's, that's what kind of kept me going. And, you know, when I was uh, a little bit younger, I played at Yeovil and, and the travel was a lot more difficult and I was still working full-time. So I think, that put me in good stead for, for what I had to kind of um, contend with last year. So, yeah, I think just that, like I said, just that drive to want to be the best I can be in everything I do drives me to want to do the things that I have done and, and continue to do. And, you know, like I said, I, I've never been the best player in the world, but I think it's that desire that's given me this opportunity this year. And even though it's only the first year I've, I've played pro and, you know, I, I probably am close to retirement, um, it's an experience that I'm certainly trying to, take every little bit of energy from, um, given that I know what I've sacrificed in the past to, to get to this point now. Excellent. And I think, you know, it, you probably appreciate it more than anybody else because of the journey you've been on. So I just want to touch on how that journey started and what initially it was that got you into football. <laughs> yeah, um, I get asked this quite a lot. Um, I've got two older brothers um, and a dad who are all football mad. Um, and when we were younger, like we grew up in a, in a small market town that had um, like a big junior club. So anyone that lived in the town or lived in nearby villages played, played for that club. Um, Weatherby Athletic, it was called. Uh, the Tangerines, we used to play in bright orange. I'll never forget that. Um, and yeah, basically my brothers played for the club. My dad helped coach. My dad refereed games. Um, and... I think I got to like eight or nine and it would come to a Sunday morning and I'd be going to church with mum while my brothers would be going to play football with dad and I wasn't happy about it so I kicked up a bit of a fuss and, and then actually a few of my brother's teammates in the men's first team um, actually set up sessions for girls 
So we used to just train once a week on a Saturday for a couple of hours and I absolutely loved it. Um, we, didn't, we didn't play any games. So I was there for three or four years at that club and we never played in a competitive league just because there weren't enough girls teams to play. Um, and yeah, I guess that's where it started. And then I, I played one year um, in a competitive seven-a-side league for a team called Rothwell, which was a bit further out um, nearer Leeds. Uh, and then I trialled for Leeds United and, and got signed for their under-16s, where I played for a couple of years before progressing into the first team there. And I presume when we look back to when you were playing youth football, there wouldn't have been the female academies and the RTCs that are currently set up at the moment. How do you feel that's benefited the female game? Oh, yeah, no. So I did play in a centre of excellence, which at the time was quite similar to what the RTCs are now, but it was nowhere near the level of the provision that is out there now for girls. Um, and I think it's phenomenal the amount of opportunities there are. I think even schools football, like I never played in a girls schools football team because we just didn't have one. Um, you know, I, I was pulling out my hair in PE lessons, making the teachers let me go and, you know, play football with the lads because we never did it in PE either. So from all the stuff that the FA have done in terms of, you know, like the, the primary school projects, um, obviously Wildcats was a really good success, which, you know, wasn't around when I was younger. Um, and, and what I love the most is that there's so many girls, talented girls playing in boys teams now. And I think at a younger age, I think that's the best thing for them. You know, I know I learned most of what I know um, playing against my brothers and playing in the park with their mates. So it's great to see that there are opportunities now for girls to play, whether that's recreationally in the Wildcats programme, in a girls team or in a, in a boys team. Um, and in terms of the RTC programme, you know, I, I currently actually do the analysis for, for our under-16s at Villa. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of the staff that work in, in the RTC setup there and it's phenomenal, um, especially over lockdown. You know, I've seen the amount of effort and time that's gone into making sure those girls have got a strength programme, a fitness programme, a technical programme. Um, they've done nutritional workshops, so they've done some cooking, live cooking and um, workshops. Uh, they've done dance lessons. Like, you know, of course, football is the main aim and, and developing players for the future, but actually what these programmes are doing are, are creating a, a great environment for those girls to develop as people as well. And I think football's always been my social outlet. It's always been my family. Um, it's always been my friends. I've got friends now that, you know, I know from years ago because of football. And I think that the way the game's gone, it, it's just such a good platform for, for young females to to aspire to, to play professionally now, which, yeah. you know, 10, 15 years ago wasn't wasn't realistic. I think as well, what a lot of people probably don't appreciate with, in, with female football as well is that you'll have, you could sign for a professional club, well, a professional semi-pro club when you're 16, but you can still play college football and box football on top of that. Did you play college football as well as playing for Leeds United? Yeah, um, I went to, to the Leeds United Academy, which at the time was only a year old, um, and it was just based at a, like a secondary school, which was a little bit... Um, uh, away from where I lived at the time and you know it, it had the promise to be great and obviously using the the name of Leeds United and everything like that we we attracted a number of good players some of which have played WSL some of which played for England at youth level but it just it just never really took off the way that academies are now um, so it, it was a great experience um, I was actually playing for Leeds first team when I was at college so that was great for my development um, playing at the college, we went to the Gothia Cup, which again was an amazing experience and, and one I'll never forget. Um, and I know a lot of friends that have been to that tournament as well with their respective colleges. And it's a fantastic event. Um, I don't know if, if you guys have been, but, you know, it's like playing in a, in a Youth World Cup. Um, so, yeah, I did play at college and I certainly played books football um, after going to America for a year, which again was three of my playing playing books football and futsal was you know probably one of the the best experiences I've had in my footballing career yeah I think that something I mean you can both relate to Natalie is the fact that we've both run college academies and we've been pretty successful in regards to that how important do you think it is for the because I know there's a lot of dropout in female football when it hits 16 how important do you think the college football and the books football program is to keep these talented female footballers in the game yeah, I think it's massive. Um, you know, looking at the provision that there are now, obviously having worked at Hartbury, 
um, and played against excellent colleges like yourself and you know the likes of like SGS who have got obviously WSL Academy players and, and team playing I think the level of college football is in this country is phenomenal now and I know when I was kind of that age the the ideal thing was to go to America and that was where you know if you wanted to be a player that's where you should go whereas now I think the provision available in this country means that girls have that opportunity to stay in England to get their education which is obviously massively important and also play at a really good level of football um, in terms of the books program as well, I know, you know, our, our Hartbury University team um, wasn't a books program team. Um, it came up from like the fourth division and was ended up playing in the first division. And I know a lot of those girls had maybe stopped playing at college age because there was no provision um, or because, you know, it wasn't deemed appropriate or whatever. So having seen, having played books football at the highest level and then seen it at a more kind of recreational development level at Hartbury, um, you know, those girls now want to push on to that elite level and that's what all programmes hopefully aspire the, inspire those girls to do. Um, so, yeah, from my point of view, I think college football, you know, the ECFA leagues um, and also the, the books football is, is massive for, for girls staying in, in the game. Um, and I think some of the programmes available now are, are absolutely crazy and it's so good to see that that provision is being made readily available for female um, footballers. Definitely. I think the dual career pathway for female footballers now is it's a huge aspect of the game. Is it was it a college university where you first started getting interested in coaching? Uh, no, do you know what? I actually did my level one when I was 16, um, while I was still at college. And that was mainly because the course was run at the college. Um, the guy who delivered it was an FA tutor, but also my college tutor and my coach at the time. So, you know, he was great and he really kind of, uh, planted the seed around you know maybe this is something I would want to do in the future because I really loved him like he was very inspirational to me and, and made me love the game um but I actually had a bit of a once I'd done my level one um I had a bit of a, a negative experience in terms of coaching um when I when I very first went out on the grass and, and had my first team so it kind of put me off for a few years and I didn't actually do my level two until maybe five or six years ago so I'm 32 now so maybe not until I was you know 25 26 um and actually it was the tutors on that course that really kind of got my love back for coaching like I've always loved the game I love playing the game I'm a big football fan I watch it all the time um but coaching I, I, I was kind of very unsure of so yeah it wasn't until I, I did my level two and, and I ended up doing a master's in sports coaching as well at the University of Gloucestershire that that kind of um, reignited my, my love for coaching and, and now I'm actually doing my A licence so it is something that I'm now considering as, as a full-time career. Do you believe that when you start coaching and went through coaching badges it helped you as a player as well? Yeah 100% and I think working at Hartbury you know they were great in terms of allowing me to manage being a semi-professional footballer um, and obviously trying to win that league and get promoted to the WSL as well as obviously running the academy full time and, and I really enjoyed my coaching at Hartbury. Um, it opened my eyes a lot to, to kind of my philosophy and my beliefs and, and who I was as a coach as well as a player and I think I've been lucky enough to play under some really talented coaches in the past um, don't get me wrong there's been coaches where I've looked at things and gone okay I wouldn't do that but actually that's helped that's helped my development as well um, and I think now as a as a more mature and experienced player if you like in, in the group I do try and see the game from the perspective of the coach um, sometimes in a WSL game when it's you know absolute just a whirlwind for 90 plus minutes it, it is difficult to do that but certainly in my reflections you know pre and post games it, it does help having that coaching lens. Brilliant. You mentioned in previous interviews as well that you fell out all over the game before signing back up with Aston Villa. What was it that first of all made you feel that way and what turned that around? Yeah, I think it's maybe just a bit of burnout. Um, I know when I was at Yeovil, for example, I was working full time in a primary school. So I was I was the sports lead in a primary school um, and I was driving. I was getting in my car after work, driving two hours. Um, and it was even though we were playing WSL2, the provision at that time wasn't wasn't as good as it is now. So I was turning up to a school. 
um, literally on a dodgy AstroTurf, training for two hours, then getting back in my car, driving back two hours, um, you know, falling asleep, getting up, doing it all again. And, and I think I just ran out of energy. Um, I played a lot of football. I played futsal. Um, there were many years where I didn't have a day off. I'd just play because I loved it that much. And, you know, at, at the end of my time at Yeovil, I ended up having quite a serious back injury. Um, and I, you know, I was told I'd never play at the highest level again. So that kind of obviously stunted my motivation a little bit. Um, and then in terms of just before Aston Villa, again, I think I put so much into my career. So I was working at Hartbury. Um, I was a mentor for the FA. I was coaching at the county FA. Um, so every night of the week, I was either training or working, having worked all day. Um, and I literally, I literally didn't get a minute to myself. So I think, I think looking back, it was probably just a bit of burnout. Um, it made me not a very good teammate. I started skipping training sessions. I lost my motivation. Um, I wasn't playing well because of that, because I was tired. I wasn't recovering well. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just burnout and, and managing the load, I guess. Um, yeah. In terms of getting it back, which I think was the last part of the question. Sorry, I've veered off a little bit. Um, Again, it, it was just that mindset of, you know, am I ready to stop playing? I had six months off and I, don't get me wrong, I went to a lot of different countries and did a lot of different things, um, which was amazing. And it, and it gave me a taste for maybe a life that I've not had because I've committed so much to football in the past. Um, but there was still something inside of me that thought, you know, I'm, I'm not done yet. You know, can I, can I still perform at this level? Are there going to be opportunities for me to still perform at this level because of all the young players coming through? Um, and yeah, I just spent, I spent 10 to 12 weeks getting fit um, working on my strength, my speed, um, getting the advice of S&C coaches, etc. And then, yeah, I went to an open trial with Villa, which led to an extended trial. And here I am now. <laughs> I think both of which came across a lot of female footballers, especially in the late teens, that seem to be unmotivated and disillusioned because they haven't quite reached the levels that they thought they would do. What would you be a message to them? Yeah, I think most of my experience has come at lower levels, I'll be honest. You know, I've, I've only spent two or three years playing WSL. Um, well, three or four playing WSL 2 and WSL 1 combined. So for me, I think you've, you've got to earn, earn your craft or learn your craft at, at those levels in order to take the next step. You know, it, you don't want to be a player just sitting on the bench at a championship club and not getting minutes when you're a young player. You, you should be on the grass playing. Um, I also think going abroad, even if it's just for six months or a season, um, is also really good. And to be honest, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I realised that was actually a reality for female footballers now. So I was lucky enough to go and play in Denmark. For I only went for a couple of months just because of full-time work. But I've got a lot of friends that are currently playing in Europe. Um, and I think if you're not getting the opportunities here, it's about finding another way to develop yourself, go out there, get some experience. Um, I definitely recommend seeking advice from an S&C coach because football specific strength and fitness is very different to going out and running a 5K every other day. Um, and I think the best shape that you can get yourself in, you're more likely to, to be able to perform at those levels um, and last at those levels. And, like I said, that's probably the only thing that's got me to where I am now is that physically I've always been able to compete. Um, the technical stuff I'm still working on and I'm still trying to get better at. But if you've got a good baseline, you know, a coach might look at that and go, do you know what? I've got a hard worker, someone who wants to develop, someone who's taken the time to look after themselves and prepare for this moment. You know, as a coach, I might be able to do the rest. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that that experience wherever you're playing it is massive. Um, and the last thing would just be to, to put yourself out there, like take risks, go to trials. Even if you get knocked back, at least you've been and you put yourself out there. I know girls that have trialed at clubs when I've been there and maybe didn't get in, but the coaches advise them to go away and get game time somewhere else. They've done that. And then actually the coaches watch them throughout that season. And then the next year they've been signed by that club at a high level. So don't give up and um, just find a different way. Brilliant. Yes, hi, Nat. I was going to ask, um, what does preparation look like for you compared to your early stage of your career? If you were to <laughs> look at your preparation now and compare it to then and advise players on how to, you know, get about in a, in a typical week, what would that look like for you? 
yeah so I'd say now it's a lot lot better and I, I think that had I been this good at preparing my body for performance five ten years ago I probably wouldn't have ended up with the injuries that I had um I think a big part of that is nutrition um I think especially with female athletes sometimes they're very kind of conscious about what they're eating and why they're eating it but I think that's why nutritional education is so important um especially if you're working full-time and then training and then you know, being required to play two, three games a week. So nutrition, hydration and sleep are probably the three that I neglected the most when I was, you know, in full flow of working full time, doing bits on the side, training, playing, etc. Um, and then I think, you know, I, I read a lot about kind of people like Ryan Giggs, who I know did a lot of yoga and it's been said that that helped him, you know, play for as long as he did, because I think he ended up playing into his mid thirties. Um, so now I do a lot of mobility flows, um, whether that's in the morning or last thing at night or the morning of a game or training. Um, activation is really key. Um, and you can find advice on that on Google. Um, I know it's not maybe as specific as it, as it could be, but if you've got an S&C coach, they should be able to advise you on that. So for me, I have really inactive glutes, which is why I have problems with my lower back. So I spend a bit of time activating them before I, I train or play. Um, and I think also just relaxation is also really key. So it's great to be engrossed in the game. It's great to want to watch yourself and watch other players and develop. But sometimes you need some time away from the game to allow your mind to kind of rest and reset. So whether that's going for a walk, whether that's, I know COVID means you can't meet with friends, but speaking with a friend, watching something on Netflix, having a bath, like it's whatever works for you. Um, and I think recently I've got into meditation, which previously wasn't something that I thought about or considered. But, um, you know, I just tried to do like five, ten minutes a day. And, and I found that that really helps with my mindset and my mental health as well. Yeah. So when you're when you are preparing as well, you spoke about that mindset. I was reading something from Zlatan Ibrahimovic about getting into a high performance state. You're speaking about being calm, but he was speaking about he had to get really angry to get at his best. You know, when you are leading up to a game, what is it that you have to do to get yourself into that high performance state? I think it's a difficult balance, to be honest. I think the calm for me more so comes after a game. So I, I naturally reflect a lot and I'm very self-critical. So if I've had a bad game, I find it really hard to sleep that night. And then for the next couple of days, even at training, I'll, it'll still be playing on my mind and I might not train as well or I might not be as positive um, or as bubbly as maybe I, I am on other days. So I think the calm for me comes post-game. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of before a game, it's about managing and controlling your emotions so as you've said you know Zatan likes to get fired up and angry whereas other people might need to be calm so that when they go into the game the anger or the you know the the motivation comes out in the game I think for me I try not to spend too much energy pre-game because if I do I know that I'm you know I might not perform as well so I do try and keep my mindset kind of away from the game in the morning of a game, just distractions, maybe read a book, watch something on telly, go for a walk, et cetera, listen to some music. Um, I really enjoy listening to the, the high performance podcast at the moment. And whilst I might not do that pre-game, that again helps with mindset and just, you know, knowing where to look and the thoughts to, to play on and the emotions that you might need to control. Um, but I do think it's very individual. I think you've got to know what works for you. And for me, I think, it's calm until I get in the dressing room. And as soon as I'm in the dressing room, I want the music up loud, I want the girls to be dancing, I want people to be having a laugh and a joke because as much as that riles me up, it also helps me relax a little bit. Yeah. Um, because I know I'm just going out on the, on the grass with my mates and, and having a kick about and, and that helps me kind of take the edge off, off the game that's, that's about to happen, if that makes sense. Yeah, completely. Thanks for the insight. Just want to touch on now, yeah, your career as it is and where you are at the moment at Aston Villa and what it was initially like when you first signed for them and you go from like you said where you had, your schedule was hectic to all of a sudden being a, a full-time professional. Yeah so last year we trained three times a week um, and we were quite lucky like the the 
the club have really supported the women's program. Um, you know, um, Christian Perso has done an amazing job at transforming the club, um, not just on the women's side, but the community, um, the youth teams, you know, some of their younger uh, male teams are performing really well at the moment. So the whole club has got a really good vibe about it at the moment. And because of that, we were really well supported last year. So there was three sessions a week, um, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, they'd be in the afternoon and the evening. But those of us that worked full time obviously only attended in the evening. Um, I was actually really lucky that Hartbury, where I was working at the time, um, eventually allowed me to have Fridays working from home. So I would travel up to Birmingham on a Thursday to train in the evening. I'd stay in Birmingham overnight and then I was I could work in the morning from home and then train in the afternoon and evening. Um, and within that schedule, not only would we do pitch sessions, we'd also have three gym sessions a week um, and then obviously play on the weekend. Um, and like I said, some of us were, were working full time. But since the summer, um, obviously turning fully professional, which was absolutely incredible to be offered a contract. Um, now it is, it is my full time job to be a footballer. So we train in the day um, with pre-COVID or without COVID, it would probably be 10 to 4. Um, but because of COVID, we're not allowed to stay on site as long. Um, so yeah, m most days we're in, we get we get two days off a week if we're if we're lucky. But they're normally not together. It's not like a weekend or whatever. Um, and then yeah, we we have gym sessions within that, pitch sessions, um, team meetings, one to one meetings, which most of which are done on Zoom at the moment. Um, and yeah, I guess it's it's for me personally, it's the first time in my life that I feel like I can go to work, do my job, love my job, come home and actually have time to myself. Whereas for a lot of female footballers, as you mentioned, that are in the championship or, or those two years below that, you know, it is a slog. It is a slog to get up, go to work, then go to training. And for me, I, I believe that's why a lot of females don't reach their full potential because, you know, travelling into Yeovil and back was it was I loved it I loved playing for them but it was so draining um, and I know a lot of talented female footballers that only play for their well, not only play but play for their local club because it's it's convenient and it's five minutes from their house whereas they could play for a team that's an hour away but because they're firefighters police women post women teachers doctors nurses like energy wise and and for their own mental health it's just not it's just not feasible. Yeah, I think that's something that is definitely an, an issue that I've came across in, in the women's game is that there's a lot of burnout. I think there's a lot of injury as well in the lower divisions because they can't do the recovery. It's hard to get the nutritional side of it. The physical demands are huge on them. What are the physical demands like playing in WSL 1 and now playing against players such as Alex Morgan, who's been rated as one of the best players in the world, and Lucy Bronze and players of that ability level? Yeah, I've always maintained throughout my career, that I think, because I always get asked a lot, what's the difference in the step up? So when you step up the leagues, what's the biggest difference? And of course, the technical ability is, is you know, without doubt phenomenal in the WSL. But for me, it is that, it is that fitness, that, that physical ability. Um, in terms of the WSL, it's, it's the speed of the game. Um, you know, you might be aerobically really fit, um, but essentially especially when you're a new team or a team that's naturally going to finish lower in the table. Um, it's, it is the repeated sprint ability. Um, you know, the ability to, if you're a defender like me, for example, the ability to step up the line, but then um, kind of adjust your body and get ready to sprint backwards if a ball goes over your head or, you know, Frank Kirby's dribbling at you 1v1. Um, so, yeah, the sprint ability, the strength, you know, there's some really, really athletic um, females in that division. Um, and they look like they, you know, wouldn't hurt a fly and they're, you know, stick thin or whatever, but they're so physically strong. And that's so important because I think, obviously, you know, you know as well as I do, using your body as a barrier in football is, is key at, at the highest level. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the repeated sprint ability and the strength are definitely two things that have I've noticed this year in particular. Brilliant. And a bit off a topic in regards to your experience, who would you say is the best player you've played against? 
Oh, there's so many. Um, the best player I've played against. When I was younger, I would have said somebody like Julie Fleeting or Kelly Smith. Um, I remember when I was 16, playing in an FA Cup final for Leeds against Arsenal. And that was the year they won everything. They didn't lose a game all season. And, you know, those players would easily play in the WSL now. Um, I think looking at it now, um, you know, Lucy Bronze is a phenomenal player, a phenomenal athlete. Um, Frank Kirby, you know, has, has been around, you know, years, but she's still, you know, she's still one of the best players in that division and she's still very young in terms of her football career. Um, and then I think you've got unsung heroes like Jill Scott, Steph Horton, um, you know, brilliant players that, again, have, have been trailblazers for the women's game. Um, Alex Morgan was very good when we played against her for Spurs and of course you know Tobin Heath is a, a phenomenal player as well so I think the inclusion of the American players in the WSL this year has been a real statement for the game in this country. Brilliant. Sean? I was going to ask another question actually which one? who's your actual favourite player? Who inspired you when you grew up and you thought I want to be like you? What female or male or either? Either. Okay, well, being a, being a big Leeds United fan, um, sorry, Carl, uh, Lucas, Lucas Radaby was always my, my idol when I was growing up. I used to have him on the back of my shirts. Obviously, he was captain at Leeds when I used to go and watch them. Um, and, of course, I was lucky enough. I used to go and watch Leeds quite a lot, especially when they were in Europe, when they were good. Um, and we had, obviously, Jonathan Woodgate. We had Rio Ferdinand. Um, you know, some really, really good centre-halves that I was able to to watch. But, yeah, Luke Stradivy was always my favourite. I think he was a great person off the pitch um, as well as on it and a, and a true leader. Um, so, yeah, I would say him. Um, in terms of the female game, um, again, it's difficult because, you know, 10 years ago it looks very different to now. But I think Steph Horton naturally is a, a great role model to to any any centre-halves coming through. Um, you know, I think she's always been a true professional um, and that's shown in the way that she's captain England and, and obviously has been at the, the height of the game for, for a number of years now. You always hear about young players coming through. Are there rumours of any players that you say, OK, this is one to look out for in the future? Um, I think there's a couple already uh, making a name for themselves in the WSL. You know, you've got the likes of Lauren James and Ella Toon at Man United. Um, I think Ella Toon's going to be a, a fantastic talent uh, and I hope hope she goes on to win things with England. Um, in terms of Aston Villa, um, Azzy is a, Azzy Ali, she's called, is um, a phenomenal um, young talent. We've got a number of good young players coming through the academy as well, players like Freya Gregory um, and Liv McCoughlin. So, I know I'm being a bit biased towards my own club, but but I really believe that Azzy will go on to have a great future in the game. She's a she's just got an unbelievable amount of energy and, and technical ability, and and she's just a great kid. Um, so I'd certainly keep an eye out for that name. You know, she's been in the England um, youth age groups, and and I really hope for her that she pushes on and, and gets a senior cap in in the future. Okay, and probably the final question from me: Is there anything that you'd like? to raise awareness about in the female game that hopefully can make a real change that would help you guys in the future, the future generations coming through? Um, yeah, I'd say there's a, like two things. I think one we've already spoken a bit about, um, and that's just managing yourself. Managing yourself, but not, not giving up on what you want to achieve because the, the opportunities now for, for girls and females to, to play professionally or even work in, in the professional game as coaches, pundits, um, commentators, etc. The opportunities are massive now. Um, so it's it, like I said to Carl earlier, it's, it's finding a way. If one door closes, it's finding another door, finding a different avenue, and and not giving up and being prepared to sacrifice to to do that. Um, and then I think the second thing um, is is probably around mental health, which I know is quite a hot topic at the moment. Um, <laughs> I didn't realise that, you know, we would maybe receive some of the comments and messages that we have being a newly promoted club. Um, but some of the, there's, there's some strange people out there that think it's appropriate to, to just send you messages that, you know, I would never dream of, of saying those words to another human being. Um, 
especially you know earlier in the season we lost 7-0 to Man City and I remember getting on the bus and looking at my, my DMs on Instagram and a random account had basically messaged me and said that he hoped my entire family burnt to hell in a car crash uh, which I which I laugh about because I'm just like what what would what could possibly force another human being to say that to somebody else anyway but in terms of football you know there's more to life than football um, so just just in terms of mental health, I think it's quite a hot topic at the moment. And I think that links back to, to managing yourself, finding time for yourself, finding time to have a social life, switch off from football, um, switch off from academics, switch off from, from your career um, and, and trying to enjoy it. You know, football is a sport that we all enjoy because we're passionate about it. And that's how it should be, whether you're a fan, a player, a coach, etc. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be my, my two. Okay, Natalie. So, um, in terms of your playing career, I wanted to ask, what are your future aspirations and what do you see yourself achieving with Villa or aim to achieve? Yeah, I think uh, it's more accepting that my playing career is probably coming to an end soon. Um, I'm just trying to live in the moment and obviously enjoy, enjoy the experience of being a pro. Um, I am hoping to get a contract extension, um, so I'm hoping in the next few weeks, obviously, that will be a discussion that I'll have. Um, so whatever the outcome of that is, you know, if I do, then great. I'd love to spend another year as a player at that football club. Um, and if it's a no, then I might consider looking at other teams. I might consider putting my name out there, but I'm also very keen to, to develop as a coach. Um, and if it's the case that, you know, I'm not offered another contract, then, you know, that's OK. That'll give me an opportunity to to go and look for, for work in, in the coaching realm. Um, and my ambition as a coach is to go and work abroad somewhere and, and develop women's football in a country that at the moment it's maybe underdeveloped and, and not focused on because I've seen, I've seen the way that it's progressed in this country. Um, and as much as my ambition would be to to come back and eventually coach a professional club in this country, um, I'd like to go and, and get some experience elsewhere, um, learn from different coaches, learn from different coaches, different teams, different leagues. Um, and essentially, like I said, hopefully make a bit of a difference in the women's game um, somewhere else. OK. I think me and Carl would agree that like, we've seen football in the female game being fast-tracked, especially in the Middle East. You know, would that interest you at some point, you know, in terms of experiencing a really different culture? Yeah, for sure. And I think my time in, in Denmark uh, helped with that. Obviously, I've, I played in America for a year. Um, I played in Denmark, like I said, for a couple of months. Uh, went to the Gothia Cup in Sweden, as I mentioned. So I have, have had some experience of playing in different countries. You know, I was... I was lucky enough when I was at uni to play for Great Britain unis and, and we went across to China to play in the World Uni Games, which was a phenomenal experience. So I just think, you know, as a player or a coach, it's it's an undeniable experience to go go abroad and, and learn from different cultures. Um, and you've seen the way that the, the men's Premier League in this country has been, you know, lit up by coaches from all over the world. You know, you've got the likes of Pep and I'm going to be biased and say Marcelo Bielsa. Um, and then you've got some really good English coaches in there as well. So for me, you know, I want to be a coach that's done everything I can to develop my portfolio and, and my profile. So for me, I firmly believe that that there can't be any, any harm in, in going abroad and, and picking up picking up bits from from other countries. So, final question from me is, do you so see yourself taking the big job in being a manager one day? Um, it's an interesting question. At the moment, I've always said that I'd rather be, I'd rather be out of the spotlight. It, for me, it's not something that I'm very good at. I, I, I don't think I deal well with that pressure, but I think being part of a coaching team um, and working on the grass and developing players and developing the team and seeing that come to fruition on a, on a game day, you know, that's where I want to be. Um, I've already mentioned, you know, trying to develop myself. I'm, I'm doing a bit in analysis at the moment um, because I think that that's the way the modern game is going. And I think a lot of modern day coaches now have to have an eye for analysis and, and understand that. Obviously, it's, it's an integral part of being a coach is, is trying to decipher and, you know, dissect a game. So, that's where I'm heading at the moment and 
I just I just want to do everything I can to make sure I put myself in the best position to to earn a good job in, in professional football. So at the moment it would be a no, but I think once I get a few more years of coaching at the elite level under my belt, um, hopefully I'll develop the confidence and, and experience I need to, to go into a role like that. And I don't think it would be a, an absolute no for the future. Yeah. Well, it seems like you know everything that you want. And me and Carl, we wish you all the best in achieving everything that you want to achieve. And we also wish you all the best for the rest of the season. Hopefully, if you get an extension, we'll be there to watch you lift the FA Cup one day or something. <laughs> yeah, so, all the Champions League, either way. <laughs> yeah, Champions League, yeah, you know. <laughs> but, no, um, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you for your time. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of the morning. And take care. Have a good day. Take care. Thanks very much, Natalie. Cool. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.